good evening, everyone. Really excited to see everyone joining our live webinar today and just really appreciate everyone taking the time to tune in. Of course, we've got some really exciting topics to cover today. Um, and for many of you, um, our special guest today needs no introduction, but uh, many, many of you probably have not met me. I'm Grace Hansen. I'm coming to you from the marketing department here at Sarah Bell, and I will be your host for today. Um, now, like I said, many of us already know our guest of honor today, Mary Kay, but for those of you who haven't had the honor to meet her, Mary Kay is a um, neurocritical care nurse from Mission Hospital, located in Mission Viejo, California. She has over 40 years of experience with an emphasis on neuroscience and ICU. She has lectured nationally and internationally on traumatic brain injury, targeted temperature management, intracranial pressure, spinal cord injury, aneurysm, subarachnoid hemorrhage, novel anticoagulants in the presence of intracranial hemorrhage and stroke. I mean, really, really extensive list on topics that she's um, an expert on. So really we're in for a treat today. Um, but many of you may not have known this, but Mary Kay was actually honored as a fellow for the Neurocritical Care Society. She actually is a past president of NCS and also um, past president of the American Association of Neuroscience Nurses. So, wow, I mean, just really extensive experience. She really comes with a breadth of knowledge. We're really in for a treat as she talks today about post-cardiac arrest um, patient care, um, meeting the new joint commission performance standards and really using a, a multidisciplinary evidence-based protocol for these critical patients. So I'm not the one you guys came to hear today. Without further ado, Mary Kay, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Grace. And welcome, everybody. Uh, I work at Mission Hospital in Mission Viejo, California, and it is a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here with you. My disclosures, uh, I've had honorarium from spe for speaking uh, at BD Neurooptics and Cerebell, and I also have um, stock options in a couple different companies. And I just want to clarify that the following presentation reflects an evidence-based review by, my, by me and my hospital team and does not intend to endorse any specific product. We're here to um, share our experiences with uh, doing an evidence-based approach to developing a comprehensive uh, multidisciplinary post-cardiac arrest protocol. The objectives are on this slide for you to navigate for and to read. So when you have a patient that enters either in the emergency department, perhaps it's an inpatient in your hospital and they sustain a cardiac and respiratory arrest, we know that once there's return of spontaneous circulation, uh, patients can sustain a phenomenon known as post-cardiac arrest syndrome. The definition proposed by uh, Nolan in 2008 is that PCAS was defined as a unique and complex combination of pathophysiologic processes, including four key elements, systemic ischemia reperfusion injury, hypoxic brain injury, myocardial dysfunction, and we deal with the underlying cause of the cardiac arrest. And each of these four categories contribute to different aspects of injury to the individual. Now, the American Heart Association and the Inter uh, ILCOR has published guidelines for decades on how we should approach cardiac arrest and then how we can best support either the patient who is awake following cardiac arrest or more importantly, the patient who remains comatose after the return of spontaneous circulation. And in that post-cardiac arrest resuscitation, there are recommendations. And you will see on this slide, recommendations, uh, the establishment of airway breathing circulation, you know, getting the 12 lead uh, EKG to uh, determine if coronary event has happened and do we need to access cardiology and our cardiac experts. But at the same time, we're also determined the neurologic state of the patient. And then based on that, we're then going to uh, continue the care of that patient uh, most typically in the critical care unit. Um, there are recommendations on early prognostication. There are recommendations on um, targeted temperature management that you will find in the AHA guidelines for advanced cardiac life support. 
Additionally, you'll see recommendations on oxygenation, ventilation, blood pressure management, and other aspects of post-resuscitation care, including EEG monitoring. And EEG monitoring is an integral component of the management of the comatose patient following cardiac arrest. And we'll get more into the details of these recommendations as we move through the webinar. I think it's important that whenever you are, uh, where, wherever you work, whether you're in a community hospital, you're in an academic center, that you have a, a clear understanding of what the evidence is and that your team comes together to make, uh, to have an agreement on how care following cardiac arrest should occur. Now, anybody who, uh, is in a hospital, chair of a resuscitation committee, maybe you're in the critical care areas or the emergency department. The Joint Commission challenged us over the last year when they came out with a recommendation in their R3 report requirement rationale and reference document that was from June 18th, 2021. I am one of three chairs of our resuscitation committee at Providence Mission Hospital. I chair, I co-chair with uh, Marnie Anderson, our nurse manager of critical care, and Dr. John Klein, one of our ER physicians. And in, in June of last year, we read the report. We had our resuscitation meeting in July of 2021. And um, we read through the recommendations and thought, hmm, well, we have this aspect of, of the recommendations, but we're not completely in compliance with some of these other performance measurements and performance standards. Now, at the same time, the American Heart Association um, and the uh, ECC, uh, Emergency Cardiac Care, the AHA uh, groups, they had met with the Joint Commission and provided some recommendations, and that's what fed into this document that was published in June of 2021. Um, I also happened to have the privilege of being a member of a panel or a group with the AHA and the Neurocritical Care Society, where we were reviewing uh, literature related to the critical care management of the post-cardiac arrest patients. So, with these recommendations that came out from the Joint Commission, our resuscitation committee discussed, like how are we gonna approach um, managing our post-cardiac arrest patients? We already had a TTM protocol, which we've had in place since 2005. So we've been doing hypothermia after cardiac arrest, now called targeted temperature management for a very long time. But our TTM protocol wasn't as robust as it could be. So when we took a look at the Joint Commission standards, which is on this slide, the standard PCO 20120, the hospital implements processes for post-arrest or post-resuscitation care. And one of the things that was outlined in there was this concept of comprehensive multidisciplinary care. And are we addressing every aspect of care, not just targeted temperature management, but how are, we, how are we managing the pulmonary system, cardiac system, the entire body system, the nervous system? And did we have agreement between the emergency department and your pulmonary critical care intensivists and your neurointensivists and your neurologists and your cardiologists and the nurses that work in all those areas, as well as respiratory therapy? So you have and pharmacy of all these disciplines that care for patients with post-cardiac arrest. And we discovered that, you know what, when we did our own gap analysis, our TTM gu guideline is great, but it wasn't meeting really the what was recommended in this standard. And then there was another standard, um, EP2, which asked hospitals to review the evidence and make sure that you had neuroprognostication uh, guidelines that your institution followed. And it's not just based on one thing, right? It's a multimodal neuroprognostication approach. So based on these two performance uh, standards and then the performance measurements, and we had already been doing performance measurements in our post-cardiac arrest patients, but we found that there was some still some small gaps. So what we did is we came together as a, as a, as a committee, a hospital-based committee, and we decided that 
in uh, January of 2022 to February of 2022, we came together and um, established a multidisciplinary team of practitioners. So I had emergency department physicians, um, three pulmonary critical care physicians, a neurointensivist, a neurologist, a cardiologist, uh, as well as nurses from the emergency department, from critical care, from palliative care, uh, respiratory pharmacy. And what we did is we uh, elected to use an evidence-based approach uh, using the Johns Hopkins model. We developed PICO statements and um, then also assembled about 170 references for our teams. We set up some teams to take a look at how we could improve our uh, resuscitation care. And um, I'm not the kind of person that brings together a group of people so that you can meet 12 times over a year and then, you know, it takes you, you know, hundreds of hours to come to consensus. There is, we will organize the information, we will present it, we will dialogue, and we are going to come to consensus. So um, our nurses, we had about 29 nurses. These are nurses that are staff nurses, nurses that may be on the clinical ladder journey, meaning they, they were advancing in their uh, uh, years of experience. And um, following an evidence-based review session where we uh, help the nurses understand how to review the science, we had a large group meeting and then we also had uh, eight small teams that we broke into where the nurses would present. They each had six to 10 articles. They would present the articles and these small teams had physicians, nurses, pharmacy, respiratory, and then we would talk about it. And in the second small group meeting, we came to consensus. And then at a large group meeting, each of the small groups presented and then we took those recommendations and put it into a protocol. So I'm not going to sit here and read off to you all the PICO questions, but just so you have kind of an idea, a flavor of what went into this, we had um, a PICO question about the immediate stabilization and uh, one that dealt with bundles of care, critical care management, both cardiac, general critical care, pulmonary, neuroassessment, management of cerebral edema, uh, seizure management, neuroprognostication, shared decision-making, and survivorship. And so following those, those uh, review of the literature, we then came to the agreement of what was going to be in our hospital-based protocol. So we began with making recommendation on the immediate post-resuscitation care. And although we wanted to call this the golden hour, we realized that it may be the golden 120 minutes or the golden two hours uh, following return of spontaneous circulation. And recognizing that the injury is not just to the heart, that the brain takes a significant hit, especially in patients who may have delay to um, bystander CPR, delays to um, uh, return of spontaneous circulation. And so having a multidisciplinary team looking at this evidence from multiple viewpoints and then making sure that when we build this comprehensive protocol that we've represented all the systems. We wanted cardiology to understand the importance of what was going on in the brain and we want the neuro and neurocritical care and the ICU nurses to know, you know, what's important in the heart. So as a, as a group coming together, what we did is we established target goals. So in our immediate first 120 minutes, we established target goals for oxygenation to our ABCs, right? So a pulse ox between 92 and 98%, a PaCO2 between 35 and 45, and a PaO2 greater than 80. We established blood pressure goals, which are slightly different than the American Heart Association recommendations. There are some recent articles, especially the ones that look at the brain and look at neurological outcomes, where you're seeing uh, better clinical outcomes or improved clinical outcomes, I shouldn't say better, uh, but some improvement in clinical outcomes neurologically with mean arterial pressures greater than 80. So we established a map greater than 80 with the caveat that, you know, it may not be possible in all patients and that it has to be individualized, right? If there's something going on in the cardiac system, this is a dialogue that, uh, that has to exist with the physician and the providers and the nursing input at, uh, for each and every patient.
Uh, T, uh, EKG, 12 lead, getting with that within 10 minutes because we also know STEMIs, you know, patients with STEMIs need to get to the cath lab. TTM candidates, recognizing that TTM needed to be initiated within 60 minutes of return of spontaneous circulation. It is not okay to wait until after the cath lab then to start your TTM, right? It needs to be started as soon as possible. And then those PCI candidates, having the cardiologist there, evaluating the patient and deciding, you know, what's the path? Are we going direct to cath lab? Are we going to wait? Uh, is it going to be delayed? So the recommendations on interventions had to do with airway breathing circulation, right? We want to titrate the FiO2 down as soon as we can get our blood gas and stabilization. We want the patient attached to monitors, assessing blood pressure, looking at our IV access and our fluid support and targeting our mean arterial pressure. Um, the neurologic assessment. So with return of spontaneous circulation, if their GCS was greater than eight, so it's nine to 15, you know, you've got someone that's got less of a neurologic hit. Um, so they're awake, they're um, following commands. Uh, you're not, not going to do targeted temperature management in that population, but what about those patients whose Glasgow coma scores are three to eight, and maybe they have reactive pupils and maybe they don't. So getting your neurologic assessment with your parameters for pupil accuracy, uh, we happen to use a pupillometer which quantifies pupil reactivity, and we use that as a trend monitor on an hourly basis throughout the first three to five days post return of spontaneous circulation in our coma those patients. We also prioritize seizure monitoring early on. So our goal is to get some type of seizure monitoring device on the patient within 30 minutes after return of spontaneous circulation, again, in comatose patients. We want our physician experts, our providers, to be at the bedside as soon as possible. So getting the appropriate consults immediately so that we can have a team plan on where we're going. The physicians, the providers are going to be looking at that differential diagnosis and they're going to lay out the plan of where we're going with our, our resuscitation, post resuscitation care. So these interventions are all listed for the emergency department under airway breathing circulation. Uh, you can see the vital sign and ECG rhythm analysis, the 12 lead EKG, peripheral access, getting our labs drawn. And then um, having the providers, the emergency department, the critical care pulmonary intensivist, the neurologist, the neurointensivist, that uh, cardiology, that agreement on is this patient a candidate for TTM? And then making the decision, um, we still cool, I would say 80% of our patients to 33 degrees. We have kept outcomes of our patients since 2005. Uh, we can tell you what those outcomes are based on their rhythm, based on um, you know, how, how fast they got to TTM. So we primarily go to 33, but we will go to 36 if um, there are certain situations. And that's for the provider team to decide. Uh, and we do make a recommendation to use a risk stratification. There's a great paper by Callaway. Uh, Pittsburgh has a, a great system where they stratify their targeted temperature management. The neuro priorities, getting an accurate neuroassessment done and documented is important. Uh, and then the um, ensuring that we're working in concert with uh, prioritizing the continued assessment, hemodynamics and neuro with the implementation of the TTM. And so we have it very spelled out on how we, how we initiate TTM. Uh, uh, we make sure the patient has a CT scan of the brain just to avoid, you know, someone perhaps having a subarachnoid hemorrhage from an aneurysm rupture and they arrested and they look like taco subo. You know, we need to know before that patient's going to cath lab, you know, do they have a bleed in their brain? You might not want to be giving that patient heparin. So it's all um, laid out in this protocol. The application of a rapid response EEG system. Um, our hospital, we're a community hospital. We're not academic. We do not have EEG techs in house 24 7. So we have three very large or four large EEG machines. We also have nine bedside EEG machines in our ICU, our CNS systems, which allow, you know, to be hooked up. But those require EEG techs to prepare and to apply. Um, we have another additional system, which is our RAP response EEG, which anybody can put on in four to five minutes. And um, we can start 
monitoring that EEG within 30 minutes of the return of spontaneous circulation. CT scan, uh, C-spine in case there's any evidence of trauma, if patient was down or collapsed down, might have uh, hurt their neck. Uh, cardiac evaluation, so there were recommendations on getting a stat echo if that is possible, and then determining the PCI candidate. These are the three recommendations that our cardiology team came to consensus about. Um, this wasn't, um, uh, it, it was, you know, do you go immediately? Who can be delayed? And so um, they take into consideration many factors. And so this was the agreement that cardiology uh, and the standard the cardiologist had set down. And then in that patient that's going, we um, develop these bundles of care. So this is our bundle for the first 120 minutes. And it covers oxygenation, ventilation, cardiac and hemodynamic optimization, consults, metabolic derangements, TTM, early cardiac intervention, neurologic care, seizure care, and families and caregivers. So we have tried to make this as simple as possible for our bedside practitioners. Uh, we had great ER staff nurses that were uh, part of uh, this team. They reviewed the evidence, and then they came up with this bedside checklist. So think, where are things, uh, where are things located? Uh, we, like everybody in the country, I'm sure in the world, has had issues with staffing, right? We have lots of staff that have left. We have travelers that are coming in. And so you have to still continue care. So we tried to make this, where do you find this? It's on the critical care cart. It's in the med room. So we developed, um, the nurses developed this bedside checklist to cover that first 120 minutes. When it came to the critical care management phase, um, recognizing perfusion is paramount, right? And reducing that secondary injury that's occurring to the brain and to the heart and to the body with that reperfusion injury. So establishing perfusion targets, uh, we probably reviewed 24 articles on blood the ideal blood pressure and mean arterial pressure. And so based on those articles, the teams made recommendations. So uh, we target a mean arterial pressure greater than 80, somewhere between 80 to 90, uh, with recommendations to consider serial echocardiograms to be done to guide treatment, engage um, long-term mortality, consider inserting PA catheters in those complex cardiogenic shock patients, uh, the pulmonary ventilation target goals I mentioned earlier, using a low volume ventilation strategy would be important, sedation and paralytics and analgesia. To be successful, if you want to get your patient, if you're doing TTM and you want to drive that patient's temperature down to 33 or 34, wherever you're going, if the patient doesn't get any sedation, it's going to take you a long while to get there. They will shiver, many often they shiver, they fight to go down. So we found that by starting some propofol, starting some fentanyl, doing a little uh, push of a paralytic, not a drip, but a push, and, uh, we can get them down to under uh, 30 uh, to 33 or 34 degrees, uh, our goals within four hours. Uh, we made recommendations on nutrition, uh, early enteral nutrition uh, with escalation of feeding during rewarming, and then op, um, other systems like optimizing hemoglobin, DVT prophylaxis, no steroids and no antibiotics. The neuroassessment and monitoring component was probably one of the larger components of our protocol that if I were to look at what we had before and what we have now. So it was really beefing up that information on the nervous system and the neurologic system, how we manage that critical patient. So we want to make sure that we have accurate assessment when possible. And let's face it, if you're doing TTM, sometimes it's really hard. You're not doing a spontaneous awakening and breathing trial on that patient, right? When they're you know down at 33 degrees. So we have to have strategies to monitor the patient that are non-invasive. We need to have strategies to reduce cerebral edema and recognize that cerebral edema is an, it, it can be a byproduct of that arrest and that reperfusion injury. And then seizures need to be detected and interventions instituted um, as needed. 
So the neuroassessment and monitoring the clinical exam, we um, looked to the literature and Gia Caden's article in 2009, Berg and Panchoff from AHA, had some very nice uh, parameters for assessment that you know, we want the nurses at the bedside in the ICU to be doing on a serial uh, assessment. And some of those include some non-invasive technologies that enables us to um, keep an eye on what's going on with the nervous system. So those non-invasive monitors can include pupillometry. Uh, we have been using that since 2003, so our nurses are very attuned to the nuances with pupillometry. Uh, you can also choose to use near-infrared spectroscopy, EEG, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, and transcranial Doppler. So these are all non-invasive tools that can be used to keep tabs on the nervous system. Um, what's important is that the staff understand what those tools are and that they have parameters to notify the, parameter, the, the provider. We want to keep the head of bed 30 to 45 degrees. Administer medications as indicated. I know the Telstar study that came out recently, you know, found that, you know, giving anti-epileptic meds really didn't improve outcomes. Uh, but making sure that you target appropriately, that you're not just given AEDs just to give them, like prophylactically. Like you, you want to measure the effect, you want to look at the EEG, and then you want to institute treatment to best uh, meet that patient's needs. Mannitol if there are uh, perhaps signs of cerebral edema, but that's all through the provider order. When we looked at the evidence review on neuro and seizures, um, we know that, there, that there's a lot in the literature about EEG patterns on the ictal, inner ictal spectrum. Um, that it develops in approximately one in three comatose post-arrest patients, and that those patients that develop those patterns tend to have worse, they're associated with worse outcomes. Um, EEG changes dynamically. Uh, there's some data from Solanke et al. in 2019 that support a potential utility of certain medications to treat epileptiform EEG activity in a subset of patients. Uh, so it's it's not a, a all or nothing kind of thing. It's, it's very specific to the nuances of your patient. EEG findings on the ictal interictal spectrum. Um, when we look at the seizures that last, uh, that may not be physically manifested, such as non-convulsive status epilepticus, um, this patient may not be manifesting seizure, but their EEG may record seizure activity. And so we also then have to consider those patients, if they're in continued state of seizure, they would be in um, non-convulsive status epilepticus if this activity is lasting five minutes or longer. And the problem with that is you're, the patient's depleting ATP, there's insufficient energy reserves, uh, and that's just gonna worsen outcome. If not recognized, if the EEG is not applied and treated, um, if you have a patient who is ongoing seizure activity, that can lead to poor outcome. So when we look at our uh, awareness of non-convulsive status epilepticus, it really has increased over the last couple decades. And there are recommendations on if, if status is occurring that we get an EEG within 15 to 60 minutes. Uh, uh, the Neurocritical Care Society had guidelines that were published in 2012 that spoke of this, this was related to status epilepticus. Um, there's recommendations in the AHA and also um, it is used, um, EEG monitoring is helpful in one of the many ways to look at neuroprognostication. Seizures do happen after cardiac arrest, as I mentioned, one in three. Uh, they can develop early during the first 24 hours, or sometimes if you have them suppressed down to 33 degrees, you may not see the emergence of seizures until they are in the rewarming process as they're returning to normal thermia. Um, seizures or that burden of seizures and myoclonus and things that happen really reflect, I think, the severity of the brain injury. And um, that is uh, mentioned in uh, many of the articles. The early appearance of an epileptiform EEG were found in one study to have an increased odds for poor outcome. And so having EEG activity or having EEG monitoring enables that neurologist, your epileptologist, your neurointensivist team to really take a look and decipher what's going on in the brain and then make appropriate treatment decisions as needed.
So there are recommendations for prompt uh, EEG monitoring uh, in the AHA guidelines. Uh, there's also uh, some recommendations from other articles. EEG monitoring for seizures, status epileptic, this should take place as early as possible, um, especially during the rewarming phase of TTM. We like to get ours on as soon as possible and monitor through that long continuum so we can, um, you know, Hopefully, you're going to see some background activity reappearing appearing early, which is a positive sign. Uh, and then as the uh, neurologist, epileptologist, and neurointensivist can um, determine, you know, the presence of seizures is the activity changing as the patient progresses from 24 to 48 to uh, 72 hours. Um, Continue, uh, continuous EEG monitoring should be continued for at least 24 hours after seizures and status in patients who fail to recover um, consciousness. So these are all recommendations that you find in the articles that are listed. Uh, Berg et al. in the 2020 guidelines um, did have some information that they outlined related specifically to seizures and EEG patterns, uh, and those are found in this particular section of the presentation. So uh, the suggestions that they make, we suggest against using the absence of EEG background activity alone to predict poor outcome in adult patients who are comatose after cardiac arrest. They suggest using the presence of seizure activity on EEG in combination with other indices to predict poor outcomes. So that's a really important point. It's not just one modality, right? It's multiple modalities as you're looking towards neuroprognostication. The specificity of the American Clinical Neurophysiologic Society defines seizures on EEG for predicting poor outcome as 100%. The specificity was consistent throughout the first 72 hours after return of spontaneous circulation. So they also suggest using burst suppression on EEG in combination with other indices to predict poor outcome in adult patients who are comatose. Uh, and what's important is that the effects of sedation have um, been eliminated in your patient population. There is a, a subcategory that is quite challenging. That's clinical myoclonus. And believe me, this is way above my pay grade. I'm an advanced practice nurse as a neurocritical care CNS. I am not a neurologist or an epileptologist. Um, but I do know from reading the literature um, that clinical myoclonus is very complex. Uh, and it does require those specialists to determine um, the presence of myoclonus, is it associated with EEG? And then, you know, it's up to them to then make that um, estimation of whether or not they um, see potential for recovery. And so um, this slide just contains some of those recommendations on clinical myoclonus. Um, the treatment of EEG patterns in comatose patients, the recent study that was published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine in February 2022, it's the Telstar study which was an open label randomized trial of suppressing rhythmic and periodic EEG patterns detected on continuous EEG in comatose survivors of cardiac arrest. So it was a random assignment one-to-one -one, of stepwise treatment with anti-seizure medications to suppress activity for at least 48 hours, uh, plus standard care compared to standard care alone. Uh, TTM was in both groups. 24% uh, of the patients had TTM at 33, and 76% of the patients had a TTM somewhere between 33 and 36. Uh, shockable rhythms were about 60%, um, and 72% in the control uh, group. So uh, the results, rhythmic or periodic EEG activity was detected a medium of 35 hours after cardiac arrest. 62% um, uh, with available data on myoclonus. Uh, complete suppression of rhythmic and periodic EEG activity for 48 consecutive hours occurred in 49 of 88 of their patients in the anti-seizure group and 2% uh, in the control group. And at three months, 90% in the anti-seizure group, 92% in the control group had poor outcome. Mortality at three months was 80% versus 82%. So their conclusions were comatose survivors of cardiac arrest, the incidence of poor neurological outcome at three months did not differ significantly between a strategy of suppressing rhythmic and periodic EEG activity with the use of anti-seizure medication for at least 48 hours plus standard care versus standard care alone. Um, so very complex issue, right? But we're at the bedside. We need to be monitoring, assessing, and monitoring our patients. So for the nursing staff, it's making sure that we do assess for the presence of seizures, that we maintain the EEG monitoring system, and that we have providers who are going to be interpreting that. 
um, we would administer anti-convulsive uh, medications as ordered by the provider, and then making sure we check the skin condition. Now, some of the challenges that many centers have is despite recommendations to have EEG monitoring, maybe you have one in your hospital or maybe you have 10 in your hospital, maybe you have lots of EEG techs 24 seven and it's really not an issue, but for many places, it is an issue. As I said, we only have EEG techs in during the daytime. So what do you do with that cardiac arrest patient or the seizure patient comes in and you have to assess their seizures at 10 o'clock at night. So we, um, when we look at, this is just a, a hypothetical model looking at financial cost of providing EEG, um, and that it's a big burden, right? A big financial burden. And when the times when people are looking at cutting uh, expenses and costs, you know, how do you make this most uh, cost effective? So let's just say that you're at a hospital and you want to provide 24 seven coverage for an EEG tech, one EEG tech in house, and that would cost an average salary $70,000 a year with some benefits, $294,000. And you buy two EEG machines. Now, this is a low ball figure. Our EEG systems were like $50,000 plus contracts for data storage. So it's a little bit more expensive than that. But um, you look at the conventional EEG 24-7 cost. Now, uh, in our model, we have an EEG tech 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, uh, let's say then you have a, a different system, maybe a rapid response EEG system, and there's um, the particular system I'm speaking about, this rapid response EEG system has uh, a, an artificial intelligence system built into it. It's called Clarity. There's a subscription price for that and for the headbands. Uh, and then when you look at the uh, not having EEG overtime, tech overtime, and the ability to really deploy these EEGs rapidly, it um, can be a cost savings. And every hospital has their own model and their own number of techs. And I'm certainly not here to speak what happens at other hospitals or, or what your capabilities are. Um, as I said, we are a non-academic center. And back in 2018, we had three continuous EEG machines and six continuous bedside CNS EEG machines for ICU patients and uh, daytime tech. So um, what we did is we purchased um, uh, six of these rapid response EEGs. And we went from um, an average wait time of, you know, sometimes if you ordered an ER, I'll show you a slide, like 20, or some hours, 25 hours, to like five minutes. And we went from doing less than 100 a year to doing over 1,272 in the first three years of, of having that expanded EEG capability. Um, this is data, it was one of our magnet documents that where we looked at the average time from EEG order by a provider to the start of EEG when it was written in the emergency department. And this is from July of 2018. And the average time was 794 minutes. And then you can see in the five consecutive months, it averaged anywhere from 10 minutes to 28 minutes, um, given everything else that's going on. So um, the system that I'm speaking about, this RAP response EEG system, it's a device a little bigger than a telephone. Uh, it has a headband that just stretches and hooks in the front and 10 electrodes that you literally twist and then squeeze the very top uh, little plunger there and it puts gel underneath. Uh, if there's not enough gel, you can add gel and you literally put their name, their date of birth, their MR number, uh, five or six things in there and you hit the, it's on Wi-Fi, you hit the record button and it streams EEG. So not only do you have streaming EEG information for your neurologist, your epileptologist, your neurointensivist who's ever reading your EEGs, you also have what's called the brain stethoscope and you have the ability because of this artificial intelligence to detect the presence of ongoing seizures or seizure burden, which is the percent of time in the last five minutes where the EEG has um, shown seizure-like activity. So um, this clarity system allows for that seizure burden. So here's an example of, of sort of what that looks like. This is an A-channel rapid response EEG of left um, and right-sided uh, leads. And this is showing you the seizure burden 
um, and the interventions that were occurring uh, by the team during this time frame. So it's very helpful for the neurologist. The nurses can enter in into the device when they give certain medications. So um, again, just a, a way to see um, and to look at that seizure burden in your patient population. So we use our rapid response EEG system when our conventional EEG is not available. So generally weekends and evenings and night times, we will deploy it until we can get the, the uh, full EEG on the patient. Sometimes it'll be on for an hour, sometimes it's on for 20 hours. So it just depends on the availability of the EEG tech. Um, we have certain high-risk patients that we target, but we find it's a nice complement to our system. So it's a bridge. Um, to our complete EEG monitoring system. And we will discontinue it as soon as we have the availability of our um, full EEG which, with our EEG techs. So just to give you some snapshots of what this can look like, this is a post-cardiac arrest patient. Um, patient has, this is birth suppression on the uh, limited rapid response EEG. This is the comprehensive EEG. So it kind of shows you, of course, many more leads um, that you're looking at. Uh, this is another view of a patient, a generalized seizure view on the rapid response EEG. And then this is the uh, view on the full EEG. So although it does have limited leads, it does give you a good clinical picture um, rather than not having um, anything. Now, the neuroprognostication component of our post-cardiac arrest protocol, um, this it was the new part, which we really hadn't had anything written down in a document, but it was one of the two performance standards that the Joint Commission had called out. So I really give credit to our, our, our director of neurology, who's an epileptologist, and our neurointensivist, Dr. Basit Rahim, Dr. Parsha Doris, and our intensivists who, you know, looked through this information and then, you know, helped us construct this neuroprognostication. Um, so neuroprognostication should not commence until 72 hours after return of spontaneous circulation and or return to normal thermia and elimination of major confounders such as sedation, neuromuscular blockers. We use a multimodal approach, right? It's not just one thing. The clinical exam is paramount. Um, centers can use SSEPs. You have EEG monitoring, biomarkers. So we do use neuron-specific analase levels. And so the higher level you know, is predictive of poor neurological outcome. And then imaging, CT and MRI. So these multiple ways of determining neuroprognostication um, was set up in our protocol. So we have a target goal, we even have a section that just has definitions and assumptions, right? So what is the definition of coma? Uh, Dr. Romer Gia Caden out of Johns Hopkins, his lead article, you know, was, was a great source for us for looking at different types of definition that we could incorporate into our um, hospital-based protocol. Clinical assessment, what makes up that clinical exam? Um, what are the physicians, the providers who's determining that clinical um, outcome? What are they looking at? And so what are those criteria that are indications of poor neurological outcomes? So the, the coma, the pupillary light reflex, corneals, um, absence of spontaneous breathing, heart rate variability, et cetera. Um, EEG monitoring, there are um, recommendations on you know, what are predictors of poor neurological outcome. And um, in our protocol, you know, we state, put the rapid response EEG, then pull the full, comp then the full comprehensive montage. Um, epileptologist, neurointensivist, neurologist monitors the EEG, and then they determine the appropriate medication administration. Uh, blood biomarkers, so um, having parameters for the NSA levels to be drawn, and then imaging the CT and MRI. And so what are those recommendations of um, that look like, you know, that could demonstrate poor neurological outcome? And then there is language on the how important collaborative dialogue is between the attending providers because you, you've got so many different specialists and you have to be able to come together and look at the data and then and then sit down and get ready to sit down with the family. Uh, so ongoing communication information sharing with the, the patient surrogate decision maker is an essential component. 
So once again, we built bundle elements for the critical care management of our post-cardiac arrest uh, patient. And um, Teresa Wava, who's our cardiovascular CNS, she worked with the nurses in our cardiac intensive care unit, and they came up with some very specific, uh, like a checklist that can be instituted to make sure, have we looked at this, this, and this? How frequent do you assess your patients? You know, to me, the maintenance phase is the most stable phase. The scariest phase of any phase to me, when you do TTM, is a rewarming phase. Um, you seeing electrolyte changes, you're seeing cerebral edema get worse. And so, you know, our, our cardiac ICU nurses, who do primarily the post-cardiac arrest care, they're very in tune if they see, for instance, NPIs in the pupillometer and the velocities, the constriction, how fast or how slow. If they see changes indicative of a worsening status, you know, they'll flag that. They'll have a discussion with the intensivist, like, you know, maybe we should, you know, should we pause, should we slow it down? a little and then pick it back up six hours from now. Um, so, you know, does that, you know, help control that rewarm period? Also different elements of blood glucose control. And if you're using insulin, because they're rewarming, they often get hypoglycemic. So uh, the, that insulin resistance sort of wears off as they rewarm. Lastly, we have performance metrics. And so the performance metrics that are outlined by the Joint Commission, um, I'm going to show you what our high level report looks like and I know you can't read it, but this is done on every single in hospital cardiac arrest. So we just had a resuscitation committee meeting this morning and I just went through the last three months of data. So we have this data that is looking at patient variables and system variables and outcome variables and event variables, but we also um, do a deep dive on any patient that's had an out of ICU arrest. So we look to see, you know, what was involved in the case. We have a modified early warning scoring system. What did the MUSE scores say? What were the actions? And then what are the opportunities for improvement? How are you going to prevent that failure to rescue in the future? And maybe there was no opportunities for improvement, but this is something that um, we do together as a team. One of our rapid response nurses actually does a deep dive and I do the deep dive. Uh, and then we send these recommendations from resuscitation committee to critical care EMS and on to, if we have to send it on for physician peer review, we'll make a recommendation at a committee to do that. But that's how we have um, uh, processed our uh, post-cardiac arrest outcome data. We've been doing that since 2001 when I first took over the um, uh, resuscitation committee. Well, um, that is the uh, lecture as for post-cardiac arrest uh, protocol priorities. Thanks so much. That's a lot of really valuable information that was shared today. Guys, really thanks for tuning in today. Really valuable stuff. Like I said, thanks so much, Mary Kay. And we hope to see everyone again very soon on our next webinar. Thank you. Bye. Bye.